everyone, I'm Rather Incoherent, and I just finished my campaign of Return to Path to Carcosa. I was playing on standard difficulty with Jenny Barnes as my Kluver and Lily Chen as her bodyguard. And I wanted to post a short review of Path to Carcosa's Return to box, what my thoughts of it were, and how I thought it improved the game. I've already laid out all the cards that I view as the most impactful, but before I get into those cards, which will be hard spoiler territory for someone who just wants a yes or no answer, yes, hard yes, Path to Carcosa, in my opinion, actually very meaningfully improves the campaign. Generally speaking, every scenario I played I thought was meaningfully improved except for two of them, and even those two were still changed. That's about as far as I can get though without talking about spoilers, so let's start talking about the scenarios themselves. Every scenario is going to have a card like this, where on the front it tells you to change your encounter sets to the return to encounter sets. And one of those encounter sets and many of the return to boxes is Ancient Evils. It is usually changed into a different type of Ancient Evils, where it's not always just place one doom, you have an option to take it as a different effect. And so I figured I'd talk specifically about Delusory Evils, because it's throughout the whole campaign. You never play with Ancient Evils, you play with Delusory Evils instead. Now, you're allowed to, instead of adding one doom to the clock, put this card in your hand, and if it's in your hand, it does two things. One of them's obvious. When you succeed as a skill test by three or more, automatically fail instead and discard Delusory Evils. That's usually a lot better than adding a Doom to the clock, so you almost always pick that, but it's still a very negative effect. The other thing it does that isn't as obvious, and especially in my playthrough because I was playing Two-Fisted, is it muddies the waters. It's not as clear who has what hidden cards because the Lucery Evils is in the deck. It's much harder to assume what your teammates have when we're playing with the Lucery Evils. Curtain Call is a scenario that's really heavy on horror damage, and a lot of it's unavoidable. This is exacerbated in two-player because you're drawing the hidden cards through a smaller pool of people, and the hidden cards are what's forcing you to take 1-1 one, one direct damage. However, because it's a scenario high on horror damage, La Comtesse is a really interesting card. She's a hunter that deals horror. Even if that was all she was, which wouldn't be very scary, a hunter that deals horror that spawns on a location that's kind of hard to get to, that would still be like a meaningful change to a scenario. However, she's not just a hunter with horror. When you kill her, she goes into your hand and counts as four cards, and she's never going to leave your hand. She has the additional forced effect after you discard one or more cards in your hand during the upkeep phase to take one horror. So if you aren't able to keep vomiting cards out of your hand and stay under four, she's going to keep hitting you for one horror. Lockham has meaningfully changes how you view the game when she shows up, and I really like it. Her subtitle is Subverter of Plans, and that's really apropos and to the point. Just, yeah, that's what she does. Because if your plans involve holding six cards in your hand, they're gone. You can't even hold four anymore. Otherwise, you'll take a horror in the upkeep phase. The biggest change to the scenario, though, is the text on the scenario card itself. You attach the scenario card to Royal Emissary, and it cannot be detached. And then, every time Royal Emissary is added to the victory display, you add a resource to this card. Royal Emissary is the recurring boss monster the scenario, and every time it comes back, it's going to come back with one more health for every investigator in the game. It's really easy to kill a 4 health enemy if you have a character who has a melee weapon and high fist. You can just kill Royal Emissary over and over and over again with no problems in the vanilla scenario. And this makes that impossible. Lily Chen has no problem killing a 4 health Royal Emissary, but when it's spawning with 10 and 12 health, you start having serious issues killing it. This adds a much more real clock to the scenario than the previous version of it did. This card makes it so that even if you're able to deal with Royal Emissary, Royal Emissary will eventually become a thing that forces you to leave the scenario. The Last King, Return to, is almost a different scenario to the original. In The Last King, you're not actually running out of time when the agenda runs out. Every three turns, you flip the agenda, and one of the people at the party is going to turn into a monster. There are only five cards under the uh, scenario card for this effect. Return to adds three more cards underneath the scenario card. So let's start by talking about Diane Devine's change. In the original scenario, Diane Devine's an aloof enemy. You can just kill her and fix the problem. But you can't anymore. The new Diane Devine's just a party guest like everyone else. You're not allowed to kill her the same as you're not allowed to kill any of the people you're interviewing. Which means that no matter what you do, you're never going to get one of the people at the party because she'll stop you from it. The exception being if you got preposterously lucky and she flipped before anyone else at the party because like everyone else, she can turn into a monster. And again, there are two encounter cards that have been added to the deck, which are party guests, and they're going to move around and get in your way, just like Diane Devine, but unlike her, you can spend an action or two resources to make them go somewhere else. And just like Diane Devine, they have their own cards to transform into a crazed guest. 
All of this gives you a lot more time to actually play the scenario and reduce this variance a lot. You're very likely to get three or four people now, depending on how well you do. In the original scenario, you could get as low as one or two people with bad variance and as many as five with good variance. So I like there's a much narrower range of results that it's less random how well you do because of all these new cards. But that doesn't cover the most important new card, Shocking Display. When you advance to this Agenda 2 for the first time, you shuffle Shocking Display into the Encounter deck. What Shocking Display does is it randomly resolves one of the Sickening Reality cards under the scenario, can't be canceled, and then it goes into the Victory Display, so it's only going to happen once. So you're not getting a full 9 extra turns from this, you're only getting 6 because of Shocking Display. The scenario is not getting easier, not really. Especially when you realize what Shocking Display does. Shocking Display guarantees that this scenario becomes a bloodbath. You're spawning a boss monster every three turns. At some point, you're going to draw a shocking display, and you're going to draw another boss monster when that happens. The encounter deck has enemies too. Six out of the 21 cards in the encounter deck are enemies. Every three turns, you're flipping a boss, and eventually, you're going to flip a boss as an encounter card. It's almost unavoidable that this scenario becomes a bloodbath, where you're fighting two of these boss enemies at the same time, and then a maniac or a maggot swarm joins the party to go with it. I think the Return to Last King is the most improved scenario in the set, and it's actually one of my favorite scenarios in the game, whereas the original Last King, I didn't really like the scenario. I liked it flavor-wise, but I didn't like it really that much as a scenario. Then, on the other end of the spectrum, we have Echoes of the Past. It only adds the Keepers of the Oath. These are set-aside enemies. When you regress Act 1 and Act 2, you spawn one of them. And honestly, these guys aren't the biggest deal. Five fists, three health can be a lot to deal with for some fighters, and I think that if I had a less competent fighter than Lily, I'd have a very different opinion on these guys. Ultimately, I think Echoes of the Past is one of the weakest scenarios in the set. Actually, I think it is the weakest scenario in the set, and I don't think Keeper of the Oath changes that. It's possible that my opinion will change in future playthroughs with the less competent fighters, but Lily just made this card so irrelevant that I have a hard time imagining a version of the scenario where I actually am afraid of this guy. Especially because I'm in control of when the act progresses, aren't I? Yeah, you're in control of when you regress act one and two. So if you know these guys are coming, which you should because you have to read the return to setup rules to know how these guys work, and when you spawn them, you just don't spawn them until you're able to deal with them. It just doesn't seem like they really meaningfully change the scenario unless you play a weak character poorly. I might be wrong on that, I might be being cynical, but Echoes of the Past remains my least favorite scenario. And they don't change that. Unspeakable Oath was a scenario I really, really liked the first time through, but I think it's because we just drew all the enemies at once. This time when I played it in the Return To set, which by all accounts has the same or more enemies, I didn't experience that at all, really. What it does, though, is it changes the version of Act 2 you get. If you have the Doubt Run, you'll be able to get Daniel Chesterfield like normal, but you'll have to attach Radical Treatment to him, which is either going to very rapidly kill whoever's controlling him, or force them to test Brain or Book at the Infirmary. At a very high number, 6 is kind of extreme for this. And if you succeed, then you get rid of the Radical Treatment, and you stop taking horror every round. I do like that Class Black Onyx reduces the difficulty of this test by 3, because it gives Class Black Onyx a reason to exist which is not how I feel about the Conviction version of this. In the Conviction version, Daniel dies instantly. He's eaten by the Host of Insanity. You get a 444 monster. It has plus two Investigator's Health, so for me it was eight. It's a massive hunter, and 484 is, like, not nothing. But it only hits for 1-1. One, one. So I just had Lily Chen walk in and beat it to death over two turns. It just wasn't very threatening. However, again, this is probably Lily Chen's hyper-competency as a fighter, ruining the way I view what is, to be fair, a threatening enemy. 484 is a serious enemy, and I shouldn't just view it as a chump that doesn't matter. Which is how I viewed almost every enemy in the game, including Hastur himself. On the whole, I like that it gives you this problem you need to deal with as soon as you find Daniel. But I also don't think it changes the scenario a particularly large amount. Speaking of not changing scenarios a whole lot, A Phantom of Truth. I haven't played the Doubt version of the campaign. I've been playing with Conviction. So I can't comment to how A Phantom of Truth feels in the Doubt run. But I assure you it feels better than what I played, because the Conviction run, for me, was a complete walkover. 
Survive for three nights was not a hard goal. It was comically easy for me, and Figure in the Shadows didn't change that. What Figure in the Shadows does is, depending on whether you have doubt or conviction, the organist will either run from you or to you. I had Jenny Barnes with six actions and Lily with safeguard, so I was just able to easily outrun the organist. It didn't matter. Even if he got to us, Jenny had six foot, he has three dodge. It's not going to be hard to evade him, especially when you consider well connected. And the mythos deck just isn't hard enough to make surviving a problem. The doubt version of the Phantom of Truth might be a fine scenario, but the conviction version is so boring and so easy to deal with that I really do not like the scenario at all as a consequence. I guess the way I would describe why Phantom of Truth is, in my opinion, better than Echoes of the Past is that the conviction version of Phantom of Truth is a boring walkover. But the doubt version is probably a real scenario where you actually do things. Whereas in Echoes of the Past, it's always forgettable, no matter what version of the game you're playing. The Pilot Mask is one of my favorite scenarios in the game. I really, really like the Catacombs of Paris, and this vastly improves them. The main way it changes the game is by impacting the Catacomb deck. There are four cards in it, one of which I didn't find very impactful and didn't choose to highlight. The research site is really interesting. There's no clues or victory here, but if you successfully investigate at six, you can reveal a Catacomb somewhere else on the map. This is the same theme as these other two cards, why I like them so much. It makes the scenario less random and gives you more player agency in how the catacombs progress. Sea of Skulls is very much in line with less randomness. Its forced effect is that when you put it into play, you put the topmost catacombs in the catacombs deck into play above, below, or to the right of the furthest location from Sea of Skulls. Then you mark that location with a horror token, and it connects for the rest of the game. If you're having a hard time imagining just what Sea of Skulls does, imagine that in your Catacombs deck, you started here, you went up, and you progressed along this path to this point. You reveal this location in its Sea of Skulls. What it does is it allows you to choose which side of the furthest location to place the Catacombs on. So that would be this location right here. So you can choose to place it on the right and drop a connection marker on it. And now, rather than being two completely disjointed paths, it's a circle, it connects. And that just makes the Catacombs tremendously less random and more player controlled. Mound of Bones is another thing that makes the Catacombs less random. This one is more direct. And the way it makes it less random is when you reveal Mound of Bones, you just place something on every side of it. You're not picking with one or placing a couple. You're placing up to four locations. Obviously, it'll only ever be three. But having a location where you just put Catacombs in all directions makes it easier to do whatever it is you're trying to do in terms of expanding your catacombs. It also has the forced effect that at the end of the round where you revealed it, it's going to summon the Malform Skeleton. There are two of these in the encounter deck, I believe. Generally speaking, I like any enemy that I see that hits for Ancient One damage and then I read it and realize it's a chump. 4-4 four, four is difficult enough to deal with to be a real threat, but one foot makes it easy enough to evade and ignore. Of course, if that is your plan, once you're more than two locations away from it, it just teleports to you. So it's not super reliable to ignore it forever. However, it doesn't actually hit for 3-3. You pick whether it's damage or horror that it inflicts when you do get hit by it. On the whole, I think that the catacombs are vastly improved by these new locations, and I like the Malform Skeleton enemy quite a lot. I already like the Pilot Mask and the catacombs quite a lot. I think I would say that the Pilot Mask is in a three-way tie with Dem Carcosa and the Last King were my favorite scenario in the bunch. But generally speaking, Return to Carcosa is just all solid scenarios. Black Star's Rise is the scenario that has two agenda decks, and you don't know which one's actually going to turn into an act deck until you regress through Agenda 2 on that given deck. It is virtually unchanged. As you can see, we switch out Delusory Evils instead of Ancient Evils, and we change a set of locations. That locations is this. We randomize Knights Hall and Cloyster, while the locations are different, the main effect is that you don't know which location is going to have the key versus which location is going to have the guide. So I would say that Black Star's Rise is basically unchanged. If you don't have meta knowledge, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference between Black Star's Rise, Vanilla, and Return to. Dim Carcosa is honestly a scenario that doesn't change that much despite having a huge number of changes. Since I love the original Demo Carcosa, that's not really much of a complaint from me. We switch out three of the encounter sets for their enhanced variants, but and while that does change the gameplay, it doesn't feel meaningfully different. 
However, we do remove the original Palace of the King from the game. In the original version, when you flip Palace of the King, it allows you to kill Hastur. But now, when you flip Palace of the King, it's going to reveal one of these locations on the map. Or more accurately, it's going to add one of these locations to the map, depending on which version of Hastur you got. And then once you've revealed this new location, you're going to have to go there, get all the clues from it, and reveal it to learn the secret. This doesn't change the scenario all of that much, but it massively improves the flavor of the scenario for me. The fact that you're going to the stage of the ward theater or the throne room or your own mind, whichever it is, I really enjoy all of these locations thematically. The throne room is actually my least favorite of the word theater and the recesses of your own mind, both being more interesting, but they're all thematically and flavorfully really interesting things to do. It also makes the scenario just a little bit longer, which I appreciate because I felt like Demjarkosa can end very quickly. This text at the bottom really doesn't matter. Hastur's health cannot be reduced to less than two per investigator until an investigator knows the secret. The original scenario is supposed to have that text. What I'm assuming is happening is there's some way that a player is able to deal enough damage on Agenda 2 to kill Haster instantly before Agenda 3 fires and makes him invincible. I'm not really sure why this text is here because the agendas already largely try to do that. High Priest of Hastur was single-handedly my favorite enemy in the game when I first saw him. He's a 6-4 enemy that is not easy at all to deal with. Two foot makes him easy enough to evade, and you're going to want to evade him because he's a hunter that spawns at the Palace of the King, and he's got the prey of the person with the most cards in their hand, which is also very likely to be the person with the most hidden cards. And he has the forced effect that when he hits you, if you have a copy of Possession in your hand, reveal it. He welcomes you into the Grand Company of the King, and you are eliminated and driven insane. So yeah, that's terrifying. He hits for lethal damage. And he's not an easy enemy to deal with. And he's not going to spawn next to you and make it easy for you either. He's going to spawn somewhere other than where you're at and hunt, which is the most inconvenient kind of enemy. However, there's a big problem with this enemy that I showcased during my run. He doesn't actually hit for damage. So, um... There's nothing on this guy that says that he's going to only engage his prey. There's nothing on him that says he's going to disengage and look for his prey. There's nothing on him that says, if you're engaged with an investigator, disengage from them and go find the guy with possession. So in my version of the game, Lily Chen drew two copies of possession and Ginny Barnes drew none. So I just had Ginny Barnes engage the high priest of Hastur before he got to us. He's not massive, so he doesn't ever do anything to Lily. He never disengages, there's nothing in the game that would make him do that. So he's just going to be engaged with Denny for the rest of the game. If he hit for one damage of any kind, it would stop that. But because he doesn't, every time Jenny did everything, this guy just played his flute and invited her to join the Grand Company and was politely declined. He just followed Jenny around the entire scenario, playing the flute, doing nothing. So I love this enemy. However, it desperately needed one horror damage. Just one horror damage is all it takes for this enemy to go from literally doing nothing to actually fulfilling the threat that it's supposed to. And it's really sad that it fails that goal. And you can say that what I was doing was dangerous, that Jenny could have drawn possession, but Jenny could have just evaded him if she did. Like, it, it's just not a problem to deal with this guy. I feel like I'm rambling because I'm just so disappointed in this card because thematically what it promises is amazing, but mechanically it fails to deliver. I think if this guy had one horror on him, I would have a much higher opinion of the return to for this set. But instead, I think it has one really cool but ultimately irrelevant enemy, and it does meaningfully improve the final parts of the scenario where you're trying to kill Hastur himself by learning the secret. None of the alternate encounter cards that I played with really stood out to me in this set. I know I played with them, but compared to my memory of Carcosa, all of them felt largely the same. There was no massive shift in the way the game played because of the individual encounter cards. I'm sure it changed the game in a meaningful way, that it was improved in some way, but it's not something massive like the stuff that I'm talking about here. I think I could recommend the Return to Box only for The Last King. But The Last King and The Pallid Mask were both massively improved. Curtain Call, Unspeakable Oath, and... Dim Carcosa were also improved slightly. Echoes of the past, I'm still ambiguous about. I understand what Keeper of the Oath is trying to do. I want to say that with a weaker fighter, it would have meaningfully changed the scenario. 
But because you control when you progress the act and there is almost no time pressure if you're keeping the cultists down, you just don't need to worry about Keeper of the Oath, I feel like. I feel like with optimal play, Keeper of the Oath never takes you by surprise, never does that much. And the scenario plays almost identically, you just have to have your fighter kill an extra enemy somewhere along the way. Before I wrap up though, I figure I'll show this. I'm just making a tier list for my own personal use of how I view the scenarios that I've played on this channel. Because now I've played them multiple times, I've had more time to consciously think about them and I feel more comfortable ranking them, especially having seen the return to box. And this is currently my tier list. I absolutely love the new version of The Last King. I'm shocked that I'm putting it above Dem Carcosa. The Paladin Mask is incredible. Generally speaking, I just really like all of Carcosa. It's only Phantom of Truth that I'm really negative about. Black Stars Rise and Echoes of the Past aren't incredible scenarios, but they're fine. It's just the conviction version of Phantom of Truth sucks. It's tedious. You just have to wait around. Which I know is a hilarious complaint coming from someone who ran the Green Man Medallion through this campaign and was waiting around in every scenario anyway. But I think that might be why I was so fed up with waiting around and why I didn't want to do it. Anyway, now that I've shown you my tier list for all the stuff I've played on the channel, I'll be wrapping up the video. I've been Rather Than Coherence. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you in the next one.